New York Times bestseller Wild, which has sold more than four million copies and was made into an Oscar-nominated film. She is here at South By for a featured session with Liz Tigelar, an accomplished writer, producer, and showrunner who has adapted another of Strayed's best-selling books into a new eight-part series for Hulu. Tiny Beautiful Things is the story of a floundering writer who becomes, naturally, a revered advice columnist while her own life is falling apart and is loosely based on Strayed's real life. Please welcome, for the first time to the South by Southwest studio, Cheryl Strayed and Liz Tigelar to the studio. Oh, thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Clapping thank for you. this. Now, uh, uh, whenever my producer and big boss, Lady Jen, says don't say anything, I feel compelled to say something. And she said, <laughs> uh -oh. don't say on live television that I absolutely loved Tiny Beautiful Things. Uh -oh. <laughs> and we get sent a lot, but it was, she said, this one, watch, you got to see this. And everyone mm. who's seen it, it really just connects with them. This is a story that's coming out, loosely based on your life, loosely based on your life, starring the, the wonderful Katherine Hahn. And before we get into it, Liz, you have said, and I'm gonna quote you, and we do some research here. <laughs> Cheryl has had a quote, profound impact on my life before you even met her. Yeah. How so? Yeah, um, well, I, um, I read Wild when it first came out. Small book. Um, small book. And I just, I, I connected with it so deeply. I loved the writing. I couldn't wait for the movie. While I waited for the movie, I read Torch, her uh, novel before that. And then a dear friend gifted me Tiny Beautiful Things. Um, and I devoured that book as well. And, you know, aside from also the machinations of like continuing to read and love Cheryl's writing, um, I like to say that personally, so Mary Oliver is one of my mom's favorite um, poets. Mm. And the beginning of Wild has a Mary Oliver quote in it. Tell me, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And that became the foundation for my wedding <laughs> to my wife, Allison. And when we named our son, we thought it'd be really great to have something that connected to our wedding. And we thought of the Mary Oliver quote, and we thought of Cheryl's book, and we named him Wilder. So this was all before I met Cheryl. So um, you were like a fangirl. So I was like a super fan. A super fan I was girl. like, I, I played it real cool when Lauren Neustetter <laughs> Oh, uses, Cheryl Strayed? Yeah, yeah, Strayed. Yeah, yeah, Stray, yeah uh, how do you say that? Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, sounds familiar. <laughs> like, you it, know, meanwhile, your hands are like, like a board of like connected dots of, uh, you know, all I mean, the Cheryl, when you hear that, I mean, that's... That's profound. That's just not a fan. That's like a, a, the, your work had such a profound impact on Liz. It influenced her marriage, <laughs> course of her life, naming of her son. Yes, I, mean, I know. It just floor you? Of course. Of yes. course you're it like, floors You're just me. like. She's like a little scared. Of course. <laughs> no, of course it, it floors me. It touches me. It moves me. It That's part of the reason that we love them. That part of, you know, part of whatever truth I was telling about the journey I was on in Wild, or the truths I tell in Tiny Beautiful Things, Liz shares them. Uh, you know, we can reach across that divide. You can, you can feel in your heart if I tell you about my love or my loss. And I think that that's what excites me more than anything. Not that Liz is a fan, but that the biggest dream I ever had for myself as a writer and I think most writers have this dream, is to connect with people. Right. You know, yeah, to make you're having them a conversation less with That's an audience, right. and, and you're hoping, will my very specific story resonate? Yeah. Will people care to the point where someone you've never met before says, this resonates with me so deeply, right. it's gonna influence my life, and then fast forward through fate, and kiss them up and good luck, yeah. your colleagues now working together. Yeah. It's a great origin story. Yeah. And you, you all have worked together before, but now you're working on this, this fantastic show. Yeah. And a question I have is on a scale of 10 to 10, how awesome is Katherine Hahn? <laughs> 10. <laughs> all right. Well, have you seen the show yet? We, we, they sent yeah. us a screen. Yeah, yeah. She, so she's awesome. I know she's awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. She's so extraordinary in the role, and she is when you were writing it, you were like, oh, yeah, it's going to be Catherine Hahn. She's going to be me. <laughs> no, I was just saying, how can I get the next word on the screen, you know, because each one is agony, right? But the dream in the end is that it will find, it, you know, its way in the world as this book has. And, yes, Catherine is so beautifully complicated and funny. Messy. And deep and messy. Yeah. Funny. And in other ways, yeah. I mean, I love, like, 
obviously she she's messy in a lot of ways as she becomes dear sugar and yet what she's also doing when she begins to write that advice is the opposite of messy she's speaking with her profound clarity mm. and i think that that is one of the, the the most interesting things about the show is there's somebody who does through her writer's voice learn how to speak with with clarity at the same time that in her own life things are messy which is why i like the tagline the tagline of the show is broken is a beautiful place to start yeah and specifically how does the show explore that because while which was just hilarious right i'm giving you advice but by the way my life is a mess yeah but by the way my messy life reveals truths that actually connect with people as opposed to this perfection that doesn't exist yeah, I think that's it. You know, we talked a lot about this idea of both and, and I think that that's part of what made Catherine so wonderful in her embodiment of Claire and in this role is that um, you don't have to be one thing or another. It's not about like, is she okay or not okay? You know, can she give advice or is her life a mess? It's the idea that you get to be both simultaneously, even if they seem to be opposing things, um, that you get to embody that together. And, and I've often said with Catherine, you know, she's not um, an actor playing a version of a human. She's just being human. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, you know, that duality, um, or maybe more than duality, because it's everything in between, um, is, is what makes her so great in, in the role. And I think is what allows you to be both you can feel broken and you can feel whole um, and it can be both at once. It's, it's interesting you said that, right? Like an actor playing human and we're so used to artifice. We're so used to the performance that when someone says something like, oh, they were just human. Mm -hmm. If like an alien was to dissect that, they're like, but aren't you human? <laughs> and especially with disinformation and, and image and branding and everyone trying to be perfect, yeah. The irony is that we're imperfect and it takes someone broken to actually connect with us, right? I, think, I feel like that's a recurring theme in your work. Like, mm -hmm. here, let me expose my wounds. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. me at my lowest low. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make the brave decision to pour it on the page. All right, universe, judge away. And the universe actually doesn't judge. The universe says, that's me. Yeah. Right, because <laughs> the universe is wounded. Mm. You know, and, and we, I mean, if, if I made you right now, um, you know, tell us a story. What's your, that's the thing that you regret the most. What's the thing you're the most ashamed of? What's the thing that's caused you the most pain? You would feel so alone at the beginning of that because you'd feel afraid mm -hmm. of all the things that we, we might judge you. And yet so everyone listening out there would say me too. Yeah. To some version of me too. Even if they didn't have your exact experience, of course, nobody can. Your life is original, but the things that you've survived, the, the most beautiful experiences you had and the ugliest experiences you, you've had are shared by all of us, not just now, but through all time, across every divide that we have of gender and culture and class and race. I know what it felt like for you to have your heart broken the first time. And I think, because I also have had my heart broken. Mm -hmm. And I think when you write into that knowingness, that, that clarity that I was talking about, you, you know, you're always connecting the particular to the universal. And I think the reason why something that we know deep down, I, know, I think other people have gone through this, the reason why we don't share it is because there's a, there's a saying in Urdu and Hindi, which I'll translate, lo kya bolenge, what will people say? Lo kya kenge, what will people say? They'll judge me, they'll make fun of me, they'll mock me. So instead of sharing it and being seen as weak, I'll put on the face, mm -hmm. I'll smile with my white teeth smiling, and I'll just march, and I'll march. And then the irony is you die. And all the people you're worried about don't even care. They mm -hmm. don't even care that you left. And I feel like in your writing, and in this show in particular, you're honest, and people want honesty. And one of the things you're honest about, a thing that people don't talk about, sex, <laughs> right? Sex is seen, especially for, you know, as I'm watching TV, inhaling pop culture, women always looking perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be ageless. You, you can't age, by the way, if you know that, right? right. Hair has to be perfect. Uh, the sex has to be orgasmic all the time. Yep. Uh, and sex in real life is messy. It's funny. Yes. It's disturbing. It's weird. <laughs> it's great. And if you can, how does that show? Because the show goes into that. Yeah. How does that? And in, in a way, it's 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 real life, but it's also groundbreaking that we're seeing this depiction of a woman in her forties. Yeah. Being sexual. Yeah. 
How does the show kind of lean into that? I and thought late forties. Very... You know? Oh, late, so my late forties. <laughs> yeah. it. Which tips. having having now traversed that decade of my own life, I'm fifty four. Forty two is a lot different than forty nine. You know, I'm and, 42 I, and I right think now. It's, so well, here you go. Yeah. You know, I think that it's really powerful to say, yeah, this is a woman who's in menopause or perimenopause and showing her sexuality with such truth and complexity. Because we didn't have that growing up. Right, just, yeah. just any of this, the, the complex nuances and the messiness of the characters, it just makes me realize we've been talking about representation. And when you both were growing up, I'm an old head, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, um. all right? Uh, yeah, you know, all right. Uh, we have wisdom, we've aged well, like wine. Uh, when, when you saw those stories or read those books, were you just sitting there going like, this is BS. <laughs> Women don't behave like this in, in stories. Like, what the F? Come on now. Did, like, and did you feel at that time, if I get the pen, <laughs> if I get the camera, I'm going to show how it's really like Liz. Do you feel like it's a moment for a corrective which reveals the truth? Yeah, and and, is, and yeah. our audience is ready for it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's interesting kind of going back to what you just brought up about sex. You know, you get scripts all the time that will describe like a woman, 49, and it might say, still sexy. Like there's always like a judgment. Do you know what I mean? Like it's um, actually you it's much more common than people think. Oh, Most scripts written by men 40, sexy. Good oh, legs. Actually, when I first wrote Tiny Beautiful Things, I I literally wrote for the male character, like 42, still fuckable. You know what I mean? Because it was I, a joke. Uh, as a know, joke. Like, because I wanted to be like, that's exactly what they write about women all the time. Um, On behalf of my species, it, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> but I think what's interesting, I mean, and what we talked a lot about with Tiny Beautiful Things is that, you know, she's beautiful. She's obviously like Catherine, Catherine's embodiment of Claire is completely sexy, like aspirational. We'd all be so lucky. Um, but we did talk about how to shoot the sex. Mm. And, you know, we definitely talked a lot about like, if two people are having sex against a wall, it's not great. Like the angle's weird. Like it's not TV s people slamming into a room and like it just going so well. Like it should be awkward. Like how people fit together is awkward. How people, you know, I mean, even. And, the and spoiler alert for those who aren't in their 40s body hurts in the 40s. <laughs> Bruises take a while to heal. <laughs> Just say. I just, so personally, I give advice for a living. Yeah. I don't recommend walls very often when it yeah. comes to sex. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You're destroying the 80s for me. What are you talking about? All the wall sex in the All 80s the was amazing. Sex. I know, I know. I mean, if you, in a pinch, it'll do, but yeah. <laughs> we, no, we're joking about that, but it's something, you know, we're making light of something so real. It's, it's like you see these depictions, and you're like, this is so unreal. Yeah. And it's often men who scripted it, it's men yeah. who directed it, it's men who coached it. And this show, it's a very intentional, female-driven show, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, showrunner, director, yeah. director writer, yeah. Uh, yeah. female lead. Yeah. How does that, because you've been part of it, where it's male-dominated, especially yeah. male-dominated industry, when you have women behind the, the lens and women with the pen, how does it shape the story? Oh, I mean, it's transformative. I think that it, becomes so much more real. You know, it's all drawn from our collective life experience. Something starts as Cheryl's book, becomes, um, you know, becomes a script that I adapt, becomes something we work on together. Writers are invited into the process. Now their experiences form it. Um, we had a largely female staff female directors come in, you know, female producers, all of it. And, and I think that, you know, there's not an inauthentic there you go. moment, you know? Because someone's gonna call bullshit on it. They're like, if you're having wall sex, yeah. you need some Bengay afterwards. Yeah. Like, what's, what's going on? Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> well, I wanna say something about, about the, the gender yeah. dynamics yeah. as well, simply because being on the other end of so many people talking to me about reading wild or reading tiny yeah. beautiful things and one of the assumptions that's made is that it's that women are inspired by it, that women read those books and of course women do but so many men i have so many men who have come to me and said some version of what you just talked about the way that the, the way you were raised was to be strong was to never reveal that true face Right. Suffer well, suffer quietly. <laughs> yes, and, and because you don't want to be judged. That's right. Be silent about what hurts you or what your feelings are. And, and one of the things that I feel so strongly ab about myself as a feminist, but myself as a feminist writer, is that, w that what we're widening and, il and illuminating is not 
just a better path for women, but a better path for men too. That's very important. And so many, I mean, men are liberated by women telling the true stories about their bodies and their lives because, you know, they have also been bound in gender roles, the same kinds of gender roles that women have been caught in throughout time. And, all, and also not taught, you know, and I can tell with friends of mine, look, I'm in my 40s, they just don't know. Yeah. And so when, when, you know, we're at that stage of our life, you know, friends are getting married, divorced, they have kids, marriages sometimes work, they don't, and then afterwards they go, no one told me that this is what I assumed. I assumed women like this. I assumed yeah. women like the toxic man. I don't even yeah. want to be this way. Yeah. And then their friends are like, I just want you to listen to me and, yeah. and get the groceries and be kind. And so it's, I think it's very interesting where the, sometimes what's lost here, and especially what's happening right now in this, in this country, is this is not just beneficial for women. This is just a story that's beneficial for people. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and men can benefit as well. It's not, it's not a female show. It's a show. It yeah. just happens to have a female centric protagonist. Yeah. Well, so many of the letter writers and even the letter writers we chose in series are men yeah. asking the questions. You know, it's not all women asking questions and it's not women necessarily asking questions about men. Um, and back to this idea of brokenness too, I think, I think one thing that's so incredible with the show and certainly in the experience of making the show is people's brokenness is how they connect. Mm. Like I always say it in a writer's room, like don't come into a writer's room and talk about how great your life is or how, what a healthy upbringing you had or- <laughs> Not great or, material for yeah, the show. Or, you know, it like, like I'm a person who like loved junior high. People are like, people don't like to hear that someone loved junior yeah. high, you know what I mean? So it's like, don't come in with what went so well, like come in with what was so hard, come in with your like deepest, darkest things that you grapple with and like from those grapplings in broken places, we connect and we'll create story. You know what I mean? It's like that's what connects people, I think. I know, it, it, and it's real, right? And so with this particular story, with, with Wild, the decision was made to make it into a movie, uh, Reese Witherspoon. Mm -hmm. And yet you take this property and you're like, nah, eight-part series. Mm -hmm. Why make that decision? Why go with a, mi with a miniseries mm -hmm. on Hulu? Um, I think it lent itself to that. I, I think it had an ongoing potential. Um, it had the ability to be kind of an overarching story that, I mean, I hope in our wildest dreams could lead to more overarching stories, you know. Um, but it, it, it worked well that way. And I think, um, you know, from a premise perspective, and I don't know if this is exactly your question, but like we, we decided to take a version of Cheryl that hadn't, Oh, that, that, was, that was different from Wild. So it was almost like the ghost ship version of Cheryl um, if she hadn't hiked the PCT and if she hadn't become the writer that she is. Like what would that person's life, what would that version of Cheryl look like? Um, and so it just felt like a lot of gr like fertile ground, I think, to also explore something that, you know, certainly feels important to me. I'm 47 and you think about, I, I feel like once, maybe it's not true for everybody, but I feel like once you hit 46, you start being so much more aware of time. I have four more years then. And what you're you doing with your time. time. You start to become almost like, at least for me, consumed with time. Yeah. Now when I look at my son, I think, well, how old am I gonna be when he graduates? Well, how old am I, am I gonna see him get married? Am I gonna see him have, you know, all these things. Um, and I think exploring a woman at this time in her life, yeah. grappling with these questions of like, I'm suddenly thinking of time, I'm thinking of my own time. In this case, I'm thinking of the time my mother didn't get. Yeah. And I'm starting to think like, am I doing what I set out to do? Am I doing what I wanna be doing? Am I living the life that I intended? And I think those are really valid <laughs> universal questions. And it's really valid universal questions, especially as we're so lucky to be at South by Southwest Studio mm -hmm. the second year in a row, because three years ago it yeah. got canceled. So the fact that we're sitting here, yeah. lucky yeah. enough to talk about this show and mm -hmm. your creation together face to face, is, as the kids say, a blessing mm -hmm. and a privilege and the fact that we're getting to live our lives and the fact that you're able to tell your stories and connect with mm -hmm. people and not going to embarrass Jen, mm -hmm. her favorite show that she's seen. So <laughs> Tiny Beautiful hey, Things. Jen. Which, inshallah, as we say, might bring on a sequel, Tiny Beautiful <laughs> Things to Beautiful Harder. Yeah. Beautiful with a vengeance. More That's beautiful. Right. Yeah, more, more beautiful. And, <laughs> tiny and more beautiful. Tiny people. and more beautiful. Thank you so much. The show, Tiny Beautiful Things, will premiere on Hulu April 7th. 
and their featured session is happening tomorrow, March 13th at 2.30 p.m. in the Austin Convention Center. Whoa, big room. Oh. Room 16 A and B. I'm your host, Wajahat Ali. Thank you for watching. Thank you.